Hello and welcome to what all the cool kids are calling M to the Onumental, the show that looks at the history behind the people and things that inspired great public monuments. Okay, so you are the most powerful man in modern European history and you've just won your umpteenth battle in a row. What do you do to celebrate? Have a great big party? Buy a nice new pair of slacks? No, only one thing will do. World's biggest triumphal arch, baby! It's 1805 and Europe is at war. Again. Napoleon is the Emperor of the French and he's just spent the last few years nicking bits of European territory that didn't really belong to him. But the other big players in Europe, namely Britain, Austria and Russia, have had enough and they've declared war on France and Napoleon. So it's not really looking very hot from a French perspective. However, Napoleon, being Napoleon, has decided that attack is by far the best form of defence and has just marched into the middle of Europe with the plan to duff up Austria and Russia before they have a chance to reign on his imperial parade. Attacking with characteristic speed and enthusiasm, he caught the Austrians with their trousers down, not literally, and gave them a good spanking at the Battle of Ulm. The next stop on the European Hegemony Express was the Russians. This lot were a bit trickier. There were a lot more of them and they were fresh. Whilst the French had been doing turbo marching just to get there in the first place and had already fought a hard battle against the Austrians. But here at the Battle of Austerlitz, against all the odds, Napoleon managed not only to beat the Russian army, but absolutely decimate them. The Russians made the Wily e. Coyote esque mistake of retreating across a frozen lake. Now, Napoleon, very much the roadrunner, in this situation, ordered the red-hot cannonballs be fired onto the lake, which cracked it and condemned 20,000 Russians to a freezing death. Austerlitz was, by Napoleon's own estimation, the most brilliant tactical battle he ever fought. That night, as he lay down to sleep, he confessed to his secretary, having witnessed the slaughter of 30,000 men, that this is the happiest day of my life. Napoleon felt he deserved some kind of prize for being so good at emperoring. So he commissioned the Arc de Triomphe, or Triumphal Arch, great French there, aping the arches that successful Roman generals and their armies would march under to celebrate their victories. But this wasn't going to be any old triumphal arch. It was to be the biggest and best triumphal arch in the world. And it was very big, so big in fact, that it took two years just to lay the foundations for the thing. And it's so big that in 1919, a daredevil pilot managed to fly a whole biplane through the middle of it. But in one rather crucial way, it was too big for Napoleon. The first time he got to pass underneath the completed arch was not as a victorious general at all, but in a coffin. The arch took almost 30 years to complete, by which time Napoleon had not only been deposed, but had well and truly snuffed it. It was only when his body was eventually repatriated from exile many years after he died that a grand funeral procession passed under the Arc de Triomphe. Since then, quite a few victorious armies have marched underneath the arch. Unfortunately, quite a lot of them haven't actually been French at all. Not what Napoleon had in mind. The Prussians, sort of Germans, did it in 1871 when they captured Paris. Then the Nazis, actual Germans, did it when they captured Paris in 1940. The French eventually got to have a go, but only alongside the Americans and Brits at the end of both world wars. And now it's not even the biggest triumphal arch. The modern military dictatorship of North Korea has built a bigger one. But it's still the most famous arch in the world and it has its own absolutely bonkers roundabout. So if you ever have the chance to drive round it and manage to do it successfully, that's a triumph in itself. Coming up next time on Monumental, the man at the center of not one, but two earth-shattering revolutions. <laughs>